We are live, coming to you from Fair Memorial Reformed Church tonight. Thank you all for coming. And I would like to especially thank Fair Memorial Reformed Church for hosting us this evening because, as you can see, it's a good facility. And we have lots of room for our membership who did not get to read about it in the beacon because it was again omitted. No thanks to Barbara, who submitted it in plenty of time. <clears throat> If you did not sign in at the door, would you please be sure you sign in before you go home tonight? At this time, I would like to ask you to pay careful attention because we have a required meeting that has to be done once a year, and tonight is our night. So tonight we'll be re-electing or electing officers. We will have a report from our treasurer who is absent tonight, but Tom will give his information and membership will also be updated tonight. Before I ask for their reports, I'm going to ask our current board to stand and please remain standing as I call the rest of the names so everyone can say, oh yes, I know these people. So Vice President Laura Connell, would you please stay, stand and stay standing? <clears throat> Barbara Bro, our recording secretary. Treasurer Ron Armson is not here. Tom Lohman, our membership chairman, is there. Hospitality, Jan Grady. Roger Sharmer, our historian. Margo Haynes is not here tonight. I don't, no, she is our publicity. And Denise Marquardt is our museum represent, and there she is, stand up. And so now you've seen us all, and at this time, I'll ask them to be seated and ask if there are any people who would like to nominate anyone from the floor. Do you have any people you would like to nominate from the floor? All offices are open if you choose. If not, then is there a motion to accept the current ones returning for another year? Pete? All right, we have a motion, and Barb, do you need to write that down, or are we good? All in favor, say aye. <clears throat> Moving on. Okay. I would like to announce that we will be having a celebration of life for Lois Ekstrand on Saturday, August 28th at the Maple Grove Park from 1 until 3 p.m., there will be a sound system available, so you will be able to hear everything that is said. And she was a very special person in our society. She was kind of the one in, who headed up the historical plaques. You know, I have a special place in my heart for her and will miss her dearly. Looking ahead, we do have a September meeting on schedule. It is the third Thursday in September, September 16. We are going to be guests of the Oceana County Historical Society. And I think we're visiting the Mears Historical Museum, but the question was, are we going to the museum or the, la the Lathrop? I have no idea. I will let you know by email as we get back into September. But do note that it is September 16 for an actual meeting. Tonight is a special meeting because it's a special meeting because we're actually in person for the second time since two years ago. And all of us who are here tonight are invited all, that means don't sneak out because I forgot to mention it at the end. Everyone is invited for cake and refreshments following. And at this time, because it is a special time not just for being together, but it's also honoring Dan Yakes who is our special presenter this evening. And I'm going to invite Tom to give his membership information and Ron Arnson's treasurer's report, and then we'll get into the rest of the meeting, which honors Dan. Ron is not here tonight, but his, uh, I have his treasurer's report, and I'll give you some round numbers. In the checking account is 4,500. In the CDs are uh, 10,000, and in the memorial fund is about 1,500. 
As far as membership, we have 143 active members, at least what we call them active. 90 of those pay every year. And if you've paid dues for 2000, we have put it towards 2000, excuse me, 2020. We have put it towards 2021. And then in the last meeting, we have moved any of that dues to 2022. Of those 90 people, 24 have already paid for 2022. I, I do have a form out there if you want to pay ahead for next year. I already mentioned the special evening to, to celebrate Dan. And at this time, I'm going to ask Ellie Dennis, representing the Whitehall Mayor and City Council, and Tom, our mayor from Montague, to present Dan with the resolution that has been drafted in his honor. You'll have to share the mic. Do you want to start? Okay. This is a resolution honoring Daniel J. Yakes. Whereas Daniel J. Yakes was a professor of United States history, Michigan history, and anthropology at Muskegon Community College from 1966 to 2008, and? Whereas Dan J Yakes was the recipient of the Muskegon Community College Distinguished Facility Award in 2014, and? Whereas Daniel J. Yakes has been a member of the White Lake community for over 50 years, and whereas Dan Yakes is diligent in research and accuracy and whereas Daniel J. Yakes has authored numerous books over the years about the White Lake surrounding area including but not limited to the many lives of Muskegon, Muskegon firsthand, Looking Aft, Abner's Flock, an illustrated history of the Muskegon Country Club, Land Between the Lakes, Logging the White, Cross River Rivals, and... Whereas Dan Yakes is a gifted public speaker, utilizing song, humor, costuming, and historical props in his presentation, and... Whereas... Daniel J. Yakes is willing to step up as a presenter on short notice, and we appreciate that so much. Now be it therefore resolved that the White Lake Historical Society recognizes and thanks Daniel J. Yakes for preserving the history of the White Lake and surrounding areas through the written word for all future generations. Signed by Deborah Hillebrand, Mayor, City of Whitehall, Tom Lohman, Mayor, City of Montague. And as we are continuing our accolades for Dan, whose books, by the way, are all available out there for purchase, on behalf of the Historical Society, yeah, <laughs> you can, <laughs> I didn't want to cough. I would like to present Dan Yakes with this clock that says, Historian Extraordinaire of the Muskegon County and the White Lake area, 2021. Would you please give yeah. him some time? At this time then, I am turning it over to Dan. You know, this reminds me of the award they gave the Cowardly Lion in the Wizard of Oz. I think it around my neck. I, oops, well, there goes my, my water. I did bring a few props. These were the concession to Cheryl. She uh, liked my lumberjack costume. So uh, I don't have a lot of stuff on the topics for tonight, but um, I brought a few things which are up here. I have some badges from the scout camps, and I have a, a helmet I wore back in 1906 or whatever. <laughs> and then a, an old-fashioned golf club. So I'll be talking about them a little bit if I remember to do that. But I'm going to try to keep this to the schedule. My eyesight is very poor, so I'm going to do the best I can with what I have. Um, if it doesn't... Um, yeah, okay, there we go. 
All right, uh, this first portion is uh, similar to the talk I gave uh, a month ago over at the book nook. You see where we do both towns. Well, uh, uh, both of these presentations were in Montague, but we try to uh, involve both towns. And tonight I'm going to talk about how the two towns are different, but then I'm going to talk about how we can cooperate like we did tonight. I'm going to sit down. Uh, let me start with uh, a long-term history uh, where this difference between the two towns came from. And we have to go back to the late and to the mid uh, 19th century. Th these are the original maps of this part of the county. And of course the lines are drawn by the state legislature, so if you wish you can blame them on the state legislature, controlled by Democrats back in those days, there being no Republican Party. Now you can see that at one time, uh, White River Township, which is just a little tiny township now, used to go way up north of Ludington, but that is uh, the origins. And of course, Muskegon was just a little township, a portion of Ottawa County. And the folks in the White Lake area tended to be somewhat uppity. They, there were times when White Lake was more populous than Muskegon, and they were more generous. They wanted to put the um, county uh, courthouse in Whitehall at one time. Well, here's the next step. Um, this uh, shows the township of Oceana. This is from an 1873 atlas and uh, the lovely folks in uh, Lansing, they were Republicans by that time, decided that the White Lake area ought to be set aside as its own township, but they gave it the name Oceana because, of course, White Lake area had once been kind of the county seat of Oceana County or was planning to be or hoping to be, but that proved to be a very uh, bad mistake. Uh, and so eventually the two townships, the two sections, separated from one another, as you can see from this map, and they roughly separated along the lines of the river, although with a few exceptions, they tried to keep uh, section lines together as wherever possible, which is roughly how it is today. Uh, the northern and western portions became Montague Township, and the southern and eastern portion became Whitehall Township. Why was that? Well, first of all, majority of the elected officials in the northwestern portion were Democrats. The local newspaper was run by a Democrat. The, most of the officials in the southern and eastern parts were Republican, and the editor of the newspaper was a Republican. And yet, most of the actual township officers were Republican because two-thirds of the population was Republican. Uh, two, and so, uh, the, the Montague folks felt jilted. They had more population, about two-thirds of the township, and uh, about one-third of the population, and Whitehall had about one-third of the area and two-thirds of the population, and there was no way a, a Democrat could get elected to anything but maybe um, dog catcher or something like that. The commissioner of the poor, perhaps. So that's where the uh, split became permanent, and it has been ever since. This is a lovely picture. It's taken from Ferry Street um, in Montague, and it's looking across the, the lake, head of the lake. And what's useful about it is that it shows the uh, two docks in the two cities. Even as of this date, 1902, the two towns were at odds with one another over shipping. Uh, both towns had um, their own little docks, their own little ferry docks. They were also used for shipping companies. The um, Whitehall dock was dedicated to the uh, Goodrich line, but those ships didn't dock in Montague. The, the People's Transit Company, which was a one-ship company affiliated with the Graham and Morton line, docked in Montague. So they were in competition even then. 
we have fond memories, most of us, of the Goodrich line, but they were uh, largely an, uh, an omnipotent company. They were unchallenged for the shipping trade most of the time on Lake Michigan, and they charged accordingly, whatever they could get away with. So it wasn't a real popular company with businesses and shipping interests. So Montague would sometimes challenge them, either by connecting up with uh, Peoples, which was connected to Graham and Morton, or by starting little shipping companies of their own. Now this, uh, I think that's um, Whitehall, right? That's downtown Whitehall. Uh, that's uh, Colby Street, uh, back in the horse and buggy days. I had a dream about this last night. I was dreaming that we were out in the countryside, south side of Whitehall, tall buildings. I don't know why they were tall. And we were in this car that had bald wheels. And we couldn't get up the hills. I don't know where the hills were, but there were hills. And so we, everybody was passing us by, and we put it in reverse and got to the bottom of the hill. And then, then the car turned into a jackass. I don't know why it did, but uh, that's must, I was thinking of that. I don't have any idea. But that's uh, downtown Whitehall. Again, on paved streets. Um, what is that? Is that? Uh, that's the... All right, that's the same road, about the same vintage, maybe a little more recent, and that's uh, Colby Street again. Uh, here again, we have another section of Colby. Many of these buildings are still there. They have been uh, spruced up a little bit and made a little more attractive. Uh, what do we have here? That's, uh, uh, I wanted to deal, this is turn of the century, uh, beginning of the uh, 19, uh, 20th century. Uh, by that point, most of the mills had gone out of business. Whitehall had uh, kept most, uh, some of theirs, however. This is the Newfer Mill, which was a um, kind of a sash and uh, trim factory. They made uh, uh, barrel staves and that sort of thing. It was um, in, uh, right along the lakefront, oh, roughly about where the marinas would be today. But they still had that mill. Uh, they also had the Eagle Tannery. Uh, it just disappeared a few years ago. And uh, that was the major employer in Whitehall, in fact, in the entire White Lake area. And uh, that's the uh, tannery from across the lake. Um, Whitehall had three distinct areas, although some people collapsed it to two. The downtown was called English Town by some. Um, then there came Bunker Hill, which was a really a bluff uh, along uh, what would be Wildcat Creek, or Bush Creek it would be, I'm sorry, Bush Creek, and then Swedentown. So some people collapsed uh, uh, Swedentown with uh, Bunker Hill. It's called Bunker Hill because of the alleged battles that occurred there. Uh, the, uh, alleged thugs from English town would try to uh, somehow invade Sweden town. Why they wanted to do that, I do not know. And uh, apparently there were, but I found no evidence of this actually happening, just stories uh, written many years later. But th those were the three parts of Whitehall. This is Montague. You see the uh, uh, Franklin House in the background. It's a color picture. The Franklin House was of course, the, the, considered the best hotel in western Michigan for many, many years, very well established firm. And of course it was in Montague, not in Whitehall. Uh, again, uh, this shows the pavilion. That's the Montague Pavilion. Right at the head of the lake, there's a, it's right next to where that little um, white building is. The, the uh, bank was in there for a time. The city hall was in there for a little while. There's still a peninsula that goes out into the lake. Uh, that's roughly where that is. That's the Montague Pavilion. That was built by the city or the village at that time in order to compete with Whitehall. Whitehall didn't, couldn't get all the traffic, so let's get for some for Montague. Uh, this is the downtown area. Again, some of those buildings are still there. And then here, here th this is um, that's the corner of uh, Mears and uh, what we now call uh, Dowling was called Bridge Street back then. And uh, here again we have, uh, this is the uh, waterfront at Maple Grove. 
Uh, so just like uh, Whitehall, uh, Montague had three sections. They have the downtown area, which was, um, we've shown you, we had uh, sometimes called South Hill. And then there's the North Hill, which is beyond what we would now call uh, uh, Stanton Boulevard and that neck of the woods. And then out in Maple Grove is, was a different village, a separate village, a little bit further to the west. And this is the uh, waterfront at Maple Grove. Um, just as Whitehall had a, um, a main industry, the main industry in Montague after the turn of the century was the uh, ironworks, the Montague Ironworks. They started as a company that made boilers and parts for the uh, mills. Uh, if you had a lumber mill, you needed a, uh, an ironworks to keep them running because they all needed these machines that needed repairs all the time. That was roughly uh, where the uh, uh, Whitehall Metal Studios is today. Uh, a little of it carried over to Montague Foods area, if you're not familiar with that area. But Montague had other businesses as well, most of them connected with agriculture. Again, Montague has always been known as the more agricultural of the two towns, uh, largely because the better farmlands were to the north and to, uh, of Montague. There were some good lands south of Whitehall too, but the better lands were in southern Oceania and northern Montague and in White River. So th this was the um, roller mills, right over what they then called uh, Dowling Brook, which provided whatever power they had, which wouldn't have been very much, now called uh, Buttermilk Creek. Uh, this is the cause of Buttermilk Creek. This was the dairy. It's right down there. It's vacant land right now, I think, right along the rail trail. But the story is that sometime or another, some dairy farmers were bringing their milk and cream to the dairy, and uh, something scared the uh, horse, and it tipped over the wagon, and all the milk and cream fell into the creek, turning it milky colored. It hasn't been Buttermilk Creek since then, but uh, that's how it got its name, as far as I know. Uh, again, this is a uh, knitting factory. Uh, there were sheep in uh, Montague and Southern Oceana County. They produced wool, and uh, that, this is where they wove it into cloth and yarn for the trade. Now, this is the bridge, of course, that kept one side of the uh, community away from the other. This is a called the Iron Bridge back then. Uh, it was a rotating bridge. Uh, it could twist on that little turnstile in the middle and uh, therefore uh, open the river to traffic. If you had, back in the logging days, you needed that for when the logging crews would bring the logs down. And if uh, you had ferries that went up the river, you needed to open the river uh, to get access for boats, little ferries. Uh, there's a story of this farmer from Montague who had been over to Whitehall for business and was coming home and uh, stopped to chat with the uh, turnstile keeper, who, keeper of the bridge. Now, I know you don't believe this, but uh, occasionally people driving their horses would stop to talk to one another. Uh, that never happens in Montague, of course, where you have to sit behind two gabbers as they yak with one another on the street in their cars, but uh, they did it then. And uh, they were yakking away, and uh, so in the meantime, the uh, uh, bridge keeper had uh, uh, finished his work and allowed a boat to go up, and then he turned it all the way around, and the uh, driver of the boat, of the uh, wagon didn't realize what he'd done, and it twisted around so that he had to go back into Whitehall again. <laughs> and of course, he wasn't very happy about that, but what do you know? So uh, here is, um, every, each town had its own fire department, village hall, and uh, uh, police department, all in one. This is the uh, Montague version of that. It was located right next to the book nook, where the book nook is now, it's just open space. Uh, it had actually three stories. You see the top two stories. The bottom story was down below. 
So you had um, the fire department would, would peel out from the bottom layer. Uh, the police department, uh, there was only a, a, a town marshal and maybe a deputy. And of course the city, uh, the village uh, council was there and the township hall was also there. A lot of them were the same people. Here is the uh, Whitehall version. Now again, a town hall, fire department, police department, uh, located about, there's a parking lot there now. Um, I don't know the name of the restaurant. It's behind uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, furniture store, Bell's Furniture Store. It's a, basically a parking lot today. This is, uh, each town had its own school. Um, this is the, uh, which is it, Montague? That's Montague School. Uh, built about where the early school is today, and all grades in the same uh, school. And uh, same thing for Whitehall. This was not their first school, but it was their, their main school. Again, all grades in the same building. Located about where the, uh, um, there, they have a bus garage over there uh, that's about where this building would have been. Each town had its own fire department, uh, and uh, in this case, they're outside the Montague Depot. Montague had a depot at one time. It was a passenger and freight depot, uh, originally um, Chicago and West Michigan, and then Pere Marquette. Again, if Montague had one, uh, Whitehall had one. And this was their passenger and uh, deep uh, passenger and freight depot located on what would be today Lake Street in Montague about at the, well there were two of them. This one is the second one at the foot of I think it would be Sophia today. Again uh, it was passenger and freight. Now in 1926 Perry Marquette uh, eliminated passenger service to the White Lake area passenger service ended at Muskegon and there was nothing to the north so they built the current um, depot for freight only uh, in, in Whitehall and it served both towns. Uh, each town had its own bank. This is the Farmers State Bank of uh, Montague. This is the um, Whitehall State Bank. They're both state banks as opposed to federal banks. Big difference between the two back in those days. Not so much anymore. The Masonic Hall is the building next to the bank. The bank building is that white one. Uh, it's now sort of a upscale uh, saloon or a tavern, Would you, brewery. All right, I guess I haven't been in there, so I don't know. Um, I don't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, and I don't go with girls who do. That's my. I'm just kind of fibbing there a little bit, but um, now here again is the pavilion. Uh, it shows a, uh, you had ferries that went out of there for the entire lake, and then of course the steamships came in there. But this only lasted until uh, about the early 20s or so. The northern and uh, extremes of the lake started silting up, and neither town would pay to have it, it had, uh, dredged. So eventually the um, main passenger and freight depot for the steamships went to Harvey's dock, which was would be called the Maple Grove uh, Park or the Montague Bathing Beach area um, today. That was Harvey's dock. This, uh, that's the city dock over in uh, Montague. Ferries operated out of that and then the steamships would go to the, uh, what we call today Goodrich Park, which is a little bit to the right of that image. Um, this is the Goodrich line, of course, that was eventually the largest shipping company on the uh, Lake Michigan. They had 12 huge steamships at one time after they had bought out all the other companies, the Crosby Line and the Graham and Morton and, and the Northern Michigan Line and so forth. They carried both passengers and um, uh, freight, mostly in the warmer months of the year, but the Alabama uh, operated year-round to uh, to and from Muskegon. They had a few other all-weather ships, but the Alabama was the most important. I, I went too fast. Too fast. Uh, I see the button. Did I go back? No. 
Uh, I'm not seeing the button very well. Or too too far. All right. There's the uh, line for the the ad for the Graham and Morton. Graham and Morton operated out of Benton Harbor, but they had pretensions of expanding, so they eventually um, did business with other companies that carried their brand, like the People's Company that operated out of Mas Montague for a while. They had regular uh, shipping and passenger and freight shipping to uh, and from Holland, but that's about as close as they got to Montague, except for that brief period when they had the People's Line. Uh, they called themselves the uh, dustless, dustless uh, way or dustless way to happy land is what they call them. I couldn't find that ad, so I put this one in, in, in its place. Happy Land is Western Michigan, in case you didn't know that. Are you happy? I, I hope so. Um, I'm going to talk about several different things from now on. Uh, the first, and all of these things, were ways in which the two sides of the lake uh, cooperated with one another. The one area that they cooperated was the tourist trade. I, I did the uh, hotels a, a month ago. So I'm going to do the resort associations, and uh, I'm going to look at five of them. One of them you might not call a resort association, but that's what I'm calling it, and I have the microphone. So if you came in, uh, there were two maps at the uh, entry. I don't know if you picked them up or not because I was in here. But what, this map was one of them. Um, did everybody get one or you did not get them? Oh, well, well you, you could, or somebody could, and they pass them around. because uh, th That way you can see where the different uh, resorts were. Oh, they're going to go in this order. We're going to start with Michelinda. Uh, that's a resort association established in the 1890s uh, south of White Lake, right along Lake Michigan. They call themselves Michelinda because they, f they found one dubious resorter who claimed to be from Indiana, and that way they could give it the name Mish Il Indy. Uh, everybody else was either from Michigan or Illinois. Uh, and this one fellow from Indiana didn't last very long, so I think it was mostly a device to create a name that they liked. Uh, and then you had Sylvan Beach. That was called at one time the Grand Rapids Resort uh, because so many of the early residents were from Grand Rapids, and those that weren't from Grand Rapids were from Chicago or St. Louis or s some other place even further west. The third one I'm going to discuss is San Juan. San Juan was created in 1898 uh, by residents from the town of St. John's, Michigan, on the other side of the state over near Saginaw. Uh, and there are two reasons to call it San Juan. First of all, most of them were Republicans, and they, uh, of course, were great, greatly uh, enamored by, uh, he wasn't president yet, but Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the hero of San Juan Hill. And then, of course, he became president, so that made it even better. And then uh, San Juan is the Spanish version of St. John, so for two reasons it's called San Juan. Then the fourth one, which isn't really an association, but I'm going to look at um, Rochdale or Fruitvale. Uh, there was an association there of sorts, uh, but it was mostly people who were trying to oppose the ownership of the company. And uh, there were a lot of tourists there who had permanent residence, so I'm counting it as a resort association. And then I'll take a look at Lakewood Club, and they're all shown on that map. Uh, Rochdale is upstream, up the river, several miles. Uh, 22 miles by boat, and uh, Lakewood Club is over to the east of Whitehall uh, on Fox Lake. So we're going to start here with uh, Michelinda. This is a view of Michelinda from the lake, from Lake Michigan, and you can see, of course, it's on a bluff, and there are quite a few cottages there. When Roger and I were working on uh, um, looking aft, he took me out there because he knew some people who lived out there, and I had never seen such shacks. I mean, they're beautiful to look at. They're very expensive to live in, I'm sure. But some of them, 
uh, didn't even have interior walls on them. They, they had nothing but rafters and open uh, side walls and so forth. Uh, they must have been, they, were they your, just your friends and the other ones were nicely fitted out or what, what was that? Or were they all like that? Roger? Oh, they have. Ch they've gotten a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Well, they were, of course, used only in the summertime, so they didn't need much heat. And I don't think they had basements, probably. And they uh, turned off the water. Well, so th there it is, and it's splendor. This is a beautiful picture of mine. It shows the old front porch overlooking the lake. This is how you entertained yourself in the summer. Um, you made sure you had plenty of bug spray, and you had somebody who could play a guitar. Or Maybe you had a, a pump organ or something like that that you could play and you'd chit chat with one another and it would be wonderful summer. I mean, they're getting away from a hectic life in Chicago or uh, some other place. Uh, here's another, this is Cottage Row. Um, again, there's not much in the way of development there. Uh, they have lawns of a sort, but uh, they're, they're still pretty rustic. And uh, this is not part of the association, but they, uh, next door they had the Michelin de Tavern or Michelin de Inn, which uh, burned down some years ago. But uh, that was again a calling card. Beautiful hotel. Um, um, this is Sylvan Beach, uh, looking at it again from the lake. In the middle there is the Sylvan Beach Hotel, which is no longer there, torn down about 45. Again, uh, this is the White Lake site. Again, depending upon where you came from, um, the Chicago people seem to prefer lots on the White Lake site. The Grand Rapids people preferred lots on the uh, Michigan side, Lake Michigan side. And this is the White Lake side. Uh, here again is the arcade. It's also their dock. The Goodrich vessels went in there. Uh, all the time in the summer. The arcade had a uh, grocery store, a post office, a beauty parlor, uh, a drug store, all the, need, all the things you needed, unless you needed something that they didn't have, and then you'd have to go to town on a ferry. Uh, of course, this was, uh, oh, I went too far. Well, this is uh, the next one. Um, I don't know how that got in there. Let me see what I missed. I'm trying to find it. I, I can't go back. Uh, here's the arcade again. I don't know how that got in there. That's uh, Rochdale. Uh, this is, uh, we're back at Sylvan Beach. Somehow that one snuck in there. Uh, this is the uh, Wabaningo Club, burned down a number of years ago, and it was right on the lake frontage at that time, on the lakefront. It was sort of their social gathering place. They could have dances there. Uh, they had Sunday worship there. It's all Protestant, so uh, if you're Catholic or some other belief system, you had to find it elsewhere. Uh, and I believe it's still that way. Uh, here's San Juan. Uh, that's again over on the Montague side. Uh, Michelinda and uh, Sylvan Beach tended to uh, relate mostly to Whitehall. They did most of their business in Whitehall. You, you'd have to take a ferry to get there usually. But eventually the ferries went out of business and the highway was built, what we call Lake Street and South Shore Drive, and you could get there by, by car. Uh, and uh, so it was closer for them to go to Whitehall. Sylvan so Beach, on the other hand, uh, did business mostly with Montague. They would buy, buy their groceries from Montague stores and uh, did most of their business with Montague businesses. This is the uh, l long dock at San Juan. It goes way out into the lake. Very shallow water there, and you can get a good idea of it there. And again, built on a bluff. This is, uh, again, Cottage Row. That building on the far left, that's the Fordney uh, cabin or cottage. Uh, uh, Uncle Joe Fordney was the owner. He was a congressman from the Saginaw Valley area and uh, was a big league, a big dealer on the tax committee in the house. Uh, he was partly responsible for the Ford D. McCarran tariff. You all remember, I'm sure, from high school history classes. And I know I emphasized it when I taught. 
uh, college. And uh, this is, again is another, again, another rustic cottage area, dirt roads and uh, summer cabins. Some of them are modernized today. Now we're here at, uh, this is uh, the beginning of the section on Rochdale or Fruitvale. Uh, you got there originally by ferry boat or launch. Uh, the company had uh, two different versions of ferry boats. They started out with a group of four uh, launches that were a little bit too deep for parts of the river. So they abandoned them. Actually, they lost them in a legal battle with the Frugale Power Company. And uh, they went and bought three new ones that were shallower draft. This one is uh, the, one of the shallow draft vessels, the uh, Ethel Parker, I think it is. I can't see it from here. But it's covered. You have a canopy on it. Uh, when you, you would come up the river, and of course, uh, there were bugs and there were things dropping off the trees, and uh, so some people really liked having that canopy over. They had to collapse the canopy to get under the bridge, but aside from that, it was not a major problem. They had three of these vessels. This is the original look of the, of the uh, association. That's their original dam. It's no longer there. It burst out back in the 20s, I think. But you can see the original building on the far side. Uh, quite a rustic scene. Here is the uh, more developed picture. Uh, that's how most people who are old enough remember it. Uh, this was Brown's Pond, sometimes called Stedman's Pond. It's a nice little impoundment of Sand, uh, Sand Creek uh, that was used in the logging days and continued in use by the resort company. Uh, a lot of um, the proms apparently were held there by Montague and Whitehall, kids both, and um, a lot of um, vacations held there as well. This, um, this is the lobby of, uh, they call it the Riverside Inn usually, although some people just call the Fruitvale Inn, and some people called it the, um, the Rochdale Inn, but there's the lobby. Uh, here's the uh, dam as it is today, although I think it's been refurbished. And uh, this was built by William Teeman. That was Sally McClough's father back in the uh, 20s, I think, and is still standing and holding back the creek. A lot of hijinks there. Uh, they had, they employed, uh, got to go back. Something's happening here. I can't seem to find it. All right. They had beauty contests every week. I'd say about three quarters of their clientele consisted of working girls. By that I mean clerks and secretaries and librarians and nurses and so forth from the big cities who would come for a week. It was really cheap. You could get your passage on the uh, Goodrich line or on the railroad. Uh, the company would then ferry you to the Rochdale until the ferries went out of business. Then they had a bus that would trot you out there to Rochdale. And uh, they kept everybody interested with contests like this. They had a uh, social director named George Schlufenflug. Uh, uh, Harry, uh, not Harry, uh, Cl Clarence Pitkin always referred to him as George XYZ because he couldn't pronounce his name. And uh, he, besides, so, uh, he would have all these little gimmicks to keep people entertained and busy. In addition to the beauty contests, they had sailing contests and horseback riding and horseshoe pitching and all kinds of other things. Uh, they also had, uh, of course, dances. And uh, I wanted to get to that next picture. Uh, not working. Oh, there it is. Uh, th th I don't know what was going on here. We got people dressed up like Arabian Nights and damsels in distress or some such thing. I suppose there were competitions to perform. Uh, I love the fellow with the fake beard. I couldn't tell at all it was a fake beard. Uh, it's, it's so, it looks so realistic. Uh, and then, of course, the three gals in their silken garb. Uh, I imagine it was a lot of fun. I mean, we're talking here teens and 20s, and uh, that was probably big time fun back then. No TV, no talking pictures. Well, something's going wrong. 
All right. This uh, is a view of, uh, this is uh, Lakewood Club, and uh, it's a view of Fox Lake. Fox Lake is not a very big lake, but it's in the middle of this big forest, and uh, it provided recreation. You could go swimming there, you could go boating or canoeing or sailing, and uh, it was just a pretty spot. Uh, again, in order to get there, you'd usually come on the railroad. Now, for the most part, uh, they could not come on the Pere Marquette uh, after 1926 because service had ended. But uh, up until that time, they could come to, um, uh, on the Pere Marquette, and the company would pick you up with their little 200-year-old uh, trotter here, um, trolley. It's really just a car that's made to look like a, uh, an engine, and it uh, initially went on these rails, and it would haul the passengers over to Lakewood Club, which wasn't very far, a couple miles. Uh, when that gave out, they replaced it with an ordinary truck on the road, and uh, eventually they started bringing the people in from Muskegon. So in some ways, Lakewood Club was associated more with, um, with Muskegon than it was with Whitehall because people normally would get there through Muskegon and then take a bus from there or some other form of transportation. Um, this is how some of them spent the summer uh, in tents. <coughs> they had tents at uh, Rochdale also. And so you, this was an inexpensive place to go. Uh, so you get to swim, you get to boat, get to hike in the woods, you get to have friendships with other people and then you spent the nights in the tent. Um, now, this next set uh, of, uh, oh, I, sorry about that. I was going to find a picture of cottages, and I didn't find the picture of the cottages I wanted. What I would have said here, if I had pictures of cottages, is that these became very popular during the Great Depression and World War II. Um, a lot of people gave up their cottages during World War, during the Great Depression. They couldn't afford to pay for the taxes, and so they just gave up on them. And then when World War II came along, um, all the factories in Muskegon were working overtime, and they didn't have accommodations for all those employees. They had increased the size of the working population by about three times, and no place for them to stay. So uh, a lot of people would buy these older cottages out at Lakewood Club and stay there and then commute back to Muskegon uh, for their work. So they had plenty of money uh, because they were working all the time, but finding lodging was difficult. Uh, after the war, a lot of the uh, federal housing uh, was uh, dismantled and taken out to Lakewood Club, and some of the buildings there today, I believe, are from World War II federal projects. Uh, this is the grocery. They're sort of self-contained out there. Uh, you could, of course, go into Whitehall or Muskegon for groceries and other supplies, but they had their own grocery store. And uh, this, I think, is the, one of the inns. They had two or three inns there for people who didn't have a cottage. I think this was the Emerson Inn. Now, we're moving to another topic here. Um, camping was also an area where the um, two towns got along with one another pretty well. Uh, Muskegon County, particularly northern Muskegon County, is camper heaven. There are dozens of camps here. I'm only going to be looking at a few of them. Some of the camps identified with Montagues, most of them identified with Whitehall. Uh, we're going to look first at the Boy Scout camps. Um, there were actually several in the White Lake area. I'm only going to look at three of them, Owasapi, and then uh, um, the two on Duck Lake, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, initially, when uh, the uh, camp opened uh, back in the teens, the scouts came to uh, Whitehall on one of the Goodrich ships. And we actually have that well documented by Clarence Pitkin and by one of the kids who was a camper that year. So here is, uh, I don't know whether they're getting off the boat or they're getting on the boat, 
I think they're getting on the vote after having spent a week or two at Owasapi. But this shows them at the uh, Whitehall Dock, uh, either disembarking or embarking, I believe, on the Goodrich, uh, on the uh, uh, Carolina. Uh, when, um, when Père Marquette quit service to uh, uh, this area, and of course then the Goodrich Line went out of business a few years later, somebody in the Boy Scouts influenced the Père Marquette Company to um, put on some passenger cars once a week uh, in order to bring in scouts and take out the scouts who had been here for a week. And they got off at Scout Landing, which is a little bit south of um, the end, uh, well, the, the uh, uh, White Lake Drive exit uh, or entrance to, the, to uh, the expressway. That's about where it was. So they would get off the, the, the line there, and then they would hike uh, over to Owasapi from there. And this shows them getting ready to go. And then the scouts who were leaving, of course, would get on those same passenger. And they were old, old, old. I mean, these were, uh, they didn't put the best cars on these trips. And then they would go back to Chicago. And that lasted for several years until the Depression uh, ended it. This is, uh, that one was out at the counter there too. This is, this is in the book, although the one in the book is much bigger. This is a wasabi, it's thousands of acres. Uh, much of it acquired from the Fruitvale Company when it went out of business. And it shows all the different camps that were in use by the scouts. They're all over the place. They started out on what they called Crystal Lake. Then the scouts changed the name to a wasabi lake. I think it's called Crystal now again. And then they also had camps on Blue, Big Blue Lake, and they're not shown here, but on Lake Wolverine they called it, which was a reservoir created by damming up Cleveland Creek. But you can see most of their trails and other, the other camps that are at Owasapi. This was the 1914. I believe that's the first year they were in business. One troop uh, outside their tent or tents. This one is their mess hall. Probably the favorite um, building on uh, the site. Uh, after all the things they have them do in camp, uh, of course, uh, you, you want a good meal. That's the one thing you remember. You got a good cook, you remember her or him. You got a crappy cook and you remember him forever. Uh, that's just sort of like loggers were that way too. Um, here again are some of the things they did. Uh, they're, they're all, all of their camps are built on lakes, and this one shows the entire camper and staff, uh, camper group and staff uh, on one of their docks. Uh, again, here we have canoe races. I think that's Crystal Lake. Uh, this is the camp on Big Blue Lake. It's an aerial, so you can see uh, the beach and you can see some of the camp buildings in the background. And of course, what do they do in scout land? They hike. I was a boy scout for a little while, and I do remember the hiking. You could uh, complete lots of your responsibilities for badges at summer camp. Uh, probably they had one for hiking. They had them for uh, rifle shooting and swimming and boating and sailing and who knows, archery, all kinds of different things. Uh, this one is, um, is that the YMCA? No, that's the Duck Lake. Uh, there are other camps besides uh, Boy Scouts, but uh, we'll get to them in a bit. Uh, this is the Chicago YMCA camp. They originally built a camp on White Lake, but abandoned it after a year or two and moved over to Duck Lake. I, they built their camp about where the uh, state park is located now, and this shows that camp from the from Duck Lake, from across the lake. They were mostly tenters. They had a couple of administrative buildings, but this shows, uh, this is the inexpensive way to camp. And of course, it's kind of the hardy way to camp. Uh, you're roughing it, you're learning uh, camping skills, and you don't learn that in a nice, cushy dormitory. You learn it in a tent. And uh, here again, we have 
uh, you can't make it out. That's still that uh, YMCA camp, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, it was? Uh, well, well Wabaningo uh, took over the camp from the Y. The story is that these, uh, Wabaningo was built by uh, scouts from uh, Evanston, Illinois. They had originally camped at uh, Owasapi, but apparently wanted to have a camp of their own. So they took a hike one day and wound up at Duck Lake and found that the land was available, so they bought it from the YMCA and turned it into a camp of their own. Uh, I thought I had a picture of an aerial of the camp, but I guess not. Now there it is. Uh, this one, um, it shows the location of the two camps. The one on the far left is what became Wabaningo. Originally, they controlled the entire northern shore, but uh, either because they were generous or because they needed money, they sold the eastern side to the scout organization from Grand Rapids, which uh, uh, the locals call it um, Shawandasi, and, and that is number two on this uh, picture. This is taken from an aerial view. Uh, in 1939, uh, the county of Muskegon uh, photographed from the air the entire county. So if you're looking for an aerial view of where you live, go down to the uh, county library and they'll have it for you, I think. At least they've had it every time I wanted one. And I think this is again Wabaningo. Uh, I can't read it with my eyesight. And uh, again, this is the, uh, is that still again Wabaningo? They were heavy on the tents again. I mean, it's much more economical to um, have tents. And of course, it's sort of back to nature. Uh, that's what they want to emphasize. They want to emphasize nature and Indian lore. And you don't do that in a nice cushy dormitory. You do that in a tent. Uh, this is the stairway. Uh, at, uh, again, they're at the base of the bluff. This is land that had once been uh, the little village of Mears, uh, owned and operated by Charles Mears as a logging and lumber center. And then it was acquired by private interests and then acquired by the Y and then acquired by the Evanston Scouts. Um, I think that's still Wab, no, that's Shawan. I would not have chosen Shawandasi as a name for a camp. Uh, this is um, from one of the lengthy poems by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And it, uh, it goes on forever. I have not memorized it. But there, there's a little part that goes, uh, uh, Shawand Shawandasi, fat and lazy. That's his name. He was a, 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 he was a, a god of the south, south of Gichigumi. Gichigumi, of course, is Lake Superior. And of course, Duck Lake is obviously south of Lake Superior. But I think Longfellow would have pronounced it Shawandasi, uh, not Shawandasi, because it goes better with fat and lazy. But I don't think the Grand Rapids coat, uh, people wanted it to be named fat and lazy. So why they picked the name, I do not know. As I say, I'd have picked another name. But I wasn't living. They didn't ask me. That was a long time ago. Here again is another scene from, uh, uh, I think, Shawandasi. That's what they call it. Um, is that more? Oh, um, I went too far. That's because I can't read. All right, Camp Holly uh, was a private camp uh, owned and operated by one of the uh, Episcopal dioceses in Chicago. And uh, the people who ran it uh, were the, uh, uh, the Episcopal uh, Choir of Chicago. Uh, all the choirs combined had, uh, would be able to send people here. And uh, it was uh, operated for many, many years as a music camp. I mean, we tend to think of Blue Lake as the original music camp, but this is the original music camp for White Lake. Uh, there were music camps also at Ravenswood. Uh, the people who owned that at one time uh, were very religious and they would bring in 
uh, musicians and singers. And, and both of these groups would, uh, now that was Catholic though, rather than Episcopal, and uh, they would have weekly concerts. I mean, the men and boys would come to practice, have a good time, enjoy themselves, relax, but they'd give an, a, a weekly concert to anybody who wanted to come. And so they did here as well. And uh, now this is Camp Hardy. Hardy was another Episcopal group from Chicago, but a, a group that uh, found homes for orphan boys. And uh, they founded this uh, on Little Blue Lake. Uh, and uh, this gives you a, a look at that. This eventually became Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp, but originally it was a Episcopal <coughs> camp for uh, young boys. Here again, we get to see some of the buildings. There, there's their headquarters and administrative building. This again is, I remember playing the sack race. I wasn't any good at the sack race. I could beat you in the real race, but not the sack race. And then of course, uh, they went out of business, uh, Camp Hardy, and they sold out to Fritz Stansel and he created Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp. Uh, took over the entire uh, area, all of the buildings, dismantled some but kept others and created this fine arts camp. Not just music, but the other fine arts as well, such as art. And of course, here's one of their concerts at the Stuart Shell. And now, uh, the last one, and I hope I'm not going too long, the last topic I wanted to talk about, which is again, shows the way in which Montague and Whitehall could, could work together, is in sports. They were opponents at sometimes as well. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at four organized sports. We're gonna start with what I think is the oldest. Uh, we can trace the uh, baseball uh, back to the uh, 1870s. There were town uh, teams back then. Um, factories had their own teams. Uh, even some of the associations had teams, although they usually played softball rather than hardball. And this is one of those town teams, the Whitehall uh, baseball team of 1910. Um, they kind of look kind of rough. Uh, they only had barely enough players to make the team. Uh, had a couple of subs, and that was it. This is some storefront in Whitehall. Probably the most famous of all those early ball players was Ira Flagstead. Um, he not only was one of the greats from uh, Whitehall, actually Montague, but he uh, was hired to uh, play for the Detroit Tigers. And uh, there's his entire record there. He batted for his career 290. Uh, they could use him today. Uh, they don't have anybody hitting that high right now. Um, he, he played also for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Getting to, is, am I going too far? I'm gonna quickly go through the rest then. Uh, he of course has kin that still live around here, although he eventually moved back to Oregon and uh, he doesn't have any direct descendants around here. Uh, this is another group. Um, both towns had teams called the Montague and the Whitehall Independents. Uh, they didn't affiliate with any factory or area. And then whenever a touring team would come to town, the best players from both teams would suit up and they would form a team to play the touring team. Touring teams included, um, I thought I had, well this is another example. Let me go back to that earlier one. Is that the earlier one? No. Uh, that earlier one. Uh, touring teams included uh, some of the Negro League teams. There was a Negro League team in Grand Rapids. There was a Negro team in Chicago. And they would tour almost every summer. And of course, these were basically pros. Uh, they were very good and they hardly ever got beat. So they would come to town at least once a year and the locals would play them and usually lose, but uh, they would be the best players from the two towns. Uh, they also played um, the, we'll show you the picture in a little bit, but the uh, House of David, they had a touring 
baseball company. They also had a touring basketball company. And uh, they would again go all over the Midwest playing local teams. Here's another, uh, the local, probably the best factory team locally was the Eagle Ottawa uh, Tannery team. This shows you the team in 1919. Again, barely enough to field a team. Uh, maybe one spear, and that's it. Again, now you gotta keep in mind that the game was played differently uh, than it is today. Uh, back in the 19th century, um, the pitcher had to pitch underhand, and he had to put the ball wherever the batter wanted it. It sort of was like how they treated the Angels this afternoon. Uh, they got all the pitches they wanted, and Detroit had a very, very tiny, uh, pardon me for grousing, but um, they lost. The, they started out 10 to 2, and they lost 13 to 10. They didn't do well. So, uh, but you could pick wherever you wanted. The catcher was about 10 feet behind the batter, so you couldn't get called for interference uh, with the batter. Um, and uh, basically, you could play as many players as you wanted to. <laughs> So it's difficult to get a hit. Uh, so th things have changed, of course, since then. This is, of course, that touring team I mentioned. Uh, the Angels had a player who could have worked very nicely with this bunch. Notice they all have long hair. That was a rule. With the Sons of David, you had to let your hair grow. And once you're married, you, you could grow a beard. So we have one beard in here. And uh, that's their touring team. They almost always won. They had a good pitcher, that's all they needed. Uh, here again is another, now we're moving to football. Football is another sport that has changed over time. Uh, back in the turn of the century, you again, every player played both sides of the ball, both offense and defense. They had very little equipment. Everybody had a different shirt. Most of them had pads for their legs. Uh, they only had one helmet and that helmet was worn by whoever was going to carry the ball. So it wasn't hard to figure out who was going to carry the ball. Forward pass wasn't permitted, uh, so they would wear these helmets. I brought a replica. Put me in, coach. I can do it. I'm old, but I can still run. Okay, well, sorry about that. So the, the game was much different. <coughs> and again, no shoulder pads, no other equipment. But again, the same rules apply to both sides. Uh, they both sides have the same patience. And uh, they both have to play both sides of the ball. So if you don't have pads, you're not going to get hit by the pads. And uh, it's all pretty much sort of like sandlock football would be. Now here again we have another of the early teams. These early football teams were associated with the high schools, but they weren't really sanctioned by the high schools. Uh, many of the players were high school kids, but there normally weren't enough of them to play an entire squad. You gotta have, have 11 players minimum. So some townies would usually join the uh, team and of course they were older boys, young men, and they provided heavier bodies and more mature uh, playing abilities. Uh, so th this is uh, the Montague team uh, on the uh, steps of what was then the Montague High School. We showed you the Montague High School um, several frames ago. Uh, this one is I got this one out of the Montague Centennial book and fixed it up a little bit, called Three Heroes. They're from Montague is all I know. I don't have names, but they sure look like they know what they were doing. Two of them even had helmets. I don't know if the guy in the derby played that way, but uh, he sure was dapper. Here we have the uh, Whitehall football players. I don't know the exact year. This was about the time that John Chisholm was playing in Montague, and uh, if you have the book uh, Fair Winds, there's a story about a football game in there 
and that was that same period. So again, that's all fiction, but uh, it, it was probably based on an actual game. Montague beat this team, um, but that didn't get into the book. Uh, here we have the uh, Whitehall football team. They at least have matching uniforms, basically uh, sweatshirts or turtlenecks or something. Uh, here we have the Montague Moonlighters. Another reason that uh, they probably weren't high school kids, most of them. Uh, probably this is from the great, um, the Prohibition era, probably early 20s, late teens, uh, because of the use of the word moonlighters, moonshiners, pardon me. Uh, again, I don't think we have any names there. Uh, here are the Montague Wildcats. This is from the 20s. So I don't know this for certain, but that's about the time that it became a, a Montague high school sport. And um, it's been a high school sport ever since. Uh, Whitehall suspended their football program during the Great Depression, but not Montague. Uh, here we have, again, a little more modern image with um, more modern looking helmets and pads and so forth. Here we have the, uh, oh, I missed one. I only have two pictures of basketball. Uh, basketball was not a particularly, is that basketball again? Yes. Uh, both of these are Whitehall. I only, I have pictures from the yearbooks, but uh, they don't go back all that far. And uh, of course, basketball was a tough sport to play. Uh, they had no rules about how big the floor had to be. In some places, they would play on a stage, like in a theater. Uh, they played in Montague on the top floor of the Franklin House, which could have been very big. Over in um, Whitehall, they built a gymnasium, which is now the park of the, uh, uh, the uh, bus garage. That building used to be a, a gymnasium. And then in the 30s, uh, Eagle Ottawa built a gymnasium for their employees, but they let the teams from both Whitehall and Montague play on it. And that was a first class gym uh, floor. So that was really the first time they had a regulation floor. You could make the floor any size you wanted to. And for a while, you could play as many players as you wanted to. Um, the forwards had to stay in the forward court. The uh, defensemen had to stay on the defensive side. And uh, so we always had uh, uh, an advantage to these defenders. Every time somebody scored a basket, you had to have another um, center toss up. So if you had a, a, a center the size of my nephew and everybody else on the team was 5'8 and 5'10, your center is going to win every jump. And so, of course, they changed the rules so that they switch uh, sides every at the end of every basket. Uh, a little more fair than that. So here are the Vikings. I thought that was so silly. But you can't call them the Vikings because they're girls. So you call them the Vikings. Do they still call them Vikings? I don't know. Um, it didn't have that problem with Montague. Um, you can have male and female moonshiners, and you have male and female wildcats, as far as I know. Now here we have um, uh, golf is the last one, I think. Uh, Whitehall got a golf course first back in about 1816. Some of the yachtsmen at the yacht club decided they wanted a golf course. It was a fairly new sport in the United States by then. So they acquired this property from the Mason family and built nine holes. And then they later on added another nine. So this was the layout of the uh, of the uh, 18 at that time. I meant to have a different picture here, but every time I put it in, it was upside down. So I put it in upside down and it came back upside down. So I put it right side up, came back upside down. So I went to this one, which is a postcard and it shows you the golf course back around that time. Uh, this again shows you the golf. They love these big bunkers, Scottish style. This was a Tom Bendelow course. Several years ago, one of his grandsons gave a talk on him. And he, had, he wrote a book. Maybe you attended that one. I don't know. I did. 
And uh, this was one of his um, uh, designs. Uh, he worked for Spalding, which would do anything like that for free as long as you bought your equipment from Spalding. So beautiful bunkers. Uh, here's apparently Whitehall, either the town or the high school, had a golf team back then, and these are the players. Uh, Montague, this is the Montague course. This is a manufactured map. <coughs> we got this uh, overview of the golf course from the county library, and uh, then we figured out where the holes, where the various uh, uh, holes were located, and uh, Steve made this up uh, so that you could see how things played out. It's just a nine whole course at that point. This is the entrance. Uh, this is on the north, oh, pardon me, the south side of the property. It's a little gravel road that comes in from Old Channel Trail. And this is the little caddy shack that was their center of operations. And I think that's it. And I'm out of, out of air anyway. So maybe somebody could turn the lights up a little bit and and if there might be some questions. That's the end. Huh? All over. <laughs> what time is it? It's quarter after eight. Oh, eight. eight. You got 15 that's more minutes if you're, if you're Oh, that's an eight. hour's worth. So, well, that's fine. Uh, there might be some questions here. Do you have any questions that you could ask? Oh, I'm sorry. I got the mic in front of me. I have to put my glasses back on. I'm almost blind in my right eye, so it's, a, it's hard for me to, I only can see through my left eye. Yes. Yes. Correct. All right, it's a little bit, probably the closest major road is White Lake Drive. It comes down and joins Lake Street where it becomes uh, South Shore Drive. It's right on the township city line. So if you go a little bit further out from town, that's Wildcat Creek. And then uh, this was a 40-acre plot. And uh, I've been in communication with the grandson uh, f of the, the founder. And he keeps calling me all the time. This, this fellow doesn't have a computer. And he lives in a part of Illinois that doesn't have a s apparently cable or anything like that. So I send him stuff, but it's all by mail, and it takes a week or more to communicate. But he's written a book on his property and, and the uh, uh, town. I'll, I'll make a copy and give it to the museum. I mean, anybody interested in that area um, would be probably very interested in it. I mean, and, and that's just one of many music uh, facilities that were in town, in this area. I mean, it's amazing. I don't know about Greenshaw. It's right, if, if you know the place, as you go on, on to, into uh, Fruitland Township from Whitehall, the city of Whitehall, it goes up a hill. And it's really at the top of that hill, about where um, uh, there's a Sandy Lane or something like that, uh, right about in there. But they had both the top and the land below as well. Anything else? My goodness, you're very easy to please. Or maybe you want your dessert. Is that it? OK. All right, well, <coughs> things were a lot different than they, the question he wants me to expand on the Democrats versus Republicans. You got to remember that it's much different back in the 19th century than it is today. Today you have a Republican Party that is largely conservative and somewhat split also. And then the Democrats that are also somewhat split but a more moderate and liberal uh, group of people. Back in the early 20, early 19th century, um, the Democrats were the majority party in the United States. You had some other smaller parties, like the uh, um, uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm blocking here, the uh, Know Nothing Party, you remember the Know Nothing Party? The Whigs, uh, earlier than that, the Federalists. Uh, and then around the mid-50s, 1850s, the Republican Party came into existence as a, a group of mostly business interests, former Whigs, who had allied with the, uh, uh, the Liberty Party and uh, the Free Soil Party that were both anti-slavery parties. So if you were either a big business interest, a bank or railroad magnet, somebody like that, uh, or if you were affiliated with uh, the anti-slavery movement, you were probably a Republican. And the Democrats were a party of farmers and the Southerners and Westerners and so forth, a kind of a mixture as well. Uh, so there was no particular stigma to being a Democrat or a Republican. It was just a band of people of uh, similar interests or at least bedfellows who were willing to band together sufficiently. Uh, but uh, party loyalty was very significant and, and all the newspapers in the country were affiliated with one party or the other. And that's one of the uh, elements I discovered that the local newspapers were extremely powerful. I mean, they're sort of like the cable news networks are today. Uh, they shape thinking. They uh, alter reality. Uh, if that's the only paper you read, and the other one you use to wrap the fish, or you never even get, then you're going to follow that line of thinking. And, uh, and as it turned out for quite a while, the uh, Montague uh, newspaper was a Democrat sheet, and the Republicans uh, had control of the forum, uh, White House forum. And so they were very, very powerful. And probably the uh, local party politics was that way too. Um, locally, they didn't, when they had local elections, like if Tom were running for mayor back in uh, 1860, he wouldn't run as a Republican or a Democrat. He'd run as part of the uh, firehouse gang or the saloon league or some other group of wherever they met. You know, that's what they would call themselves. Uh, and they did operate out of saloons. That was a good way to buy votes. I mean, you'd buy somebody a drink, you make sure they vote that way. And again, how do you know that? Because they didn't have the Australian ballot. I mean, when you went into the voting place up until 1900, you had to get your vo ballot from the party table. So when you go in the door and you go to the Democratic table, everybody knows you're going to vote Democratic. <laughs> and if you come in and go to the Republican table, you're going to vote. <coughs> now, you could cross off a name and write in another name. That was legal. Or you could get a sticker if you didn't know how to write, and uh, you could put the name of that other person uh, where you wanted it to be, you know, from the other party, or just a write-in. So they now? can't do that anymore. Uh, not, not legal. Now, of course, it depends on where you are. I suppose al almost anything is possible in some places, but it's not legal to do it that way. But uh, uh, so, so party politics was very, very powerful. And, uh, you know, each party would have its uh, people at the polls to make sure their guys got there, and if they, your guys didn't get there, they send out a wagon to make sure they picked them up at the <laughs> saloon or at the mill or wherever they were, and um, make sure they got to the poll. And, and then they knew how to vote. Or if they didn't know how to write, they knew how to put the, where to put the sticker, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, that's why we needed the Australian ballot, because that uh, all names were on the ballot. You could still strike out a name and write in another, but uh, and it was secret. You, I mean, you got one ballot for everybody, and nobody knew except yourself or whoever you wanted to tell uh, how you voted. So, I mean, the, the whole thing is much different than it is today. And so politics was extremely important. Anything else? I'm just keeping you from your lunch. Okay. Well, you can talk later on if you want. I would like to remind all of you that we do have refreshments, a cake, Honoring Dan for his community service over these years. Oh, there are stuff up here if you want to look at the... Yep, look at the yeah. helmet. Yeah, where the helmet has His club. Oh, I meant to tell you, uh, this is an old hickory uh, shafted club, and it's uh, a number two wood called a brassy. Who else would have a brassy but me, you know? 
I'm pretty brassy. So uh, things were a lot different, obviously, 100 years ago. And also, please take the opportunity to look at all of the books that he has for sale. If you have not yet completed your collection, tonight's a good night to shop. Christmas is coming just four months away from now. And I'm going to ask you to, again, thank Dan for his evening. Are there oh the cake is there the table is there the tables are there <laughs> sorry and I'm sorry for coughing all night excuse me